Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you can tell from my very concise title up there, we're going to be talking about mechanical properties of PLP conduit systems, um, which is uh, it provides an overview of my doctoral work when I was at the University of Texas at Austin, um, working under the supervision of Kevin Foliard. Um, so I've listed my collaborators on the project here. Um, got a lot of slides to get through, so uh, I'm going to speak kind of fast and then I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have at the end. Um, and I'll also provide some references because um, I'm going to be presenting a lot of data. So um, starting out with the outline, we're going to be talking about the project background, what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're going to talk about how we did it. Um, I'm going to give you the results and then we're going to talk about some of the uh, most important conclusions here. So uh, a little bit about the project. This was done back uh, a few years ago. The Texas Department of Transportation was interested in using PLC concrete for um, transportation infrastructure in general, but more specifically for pavement applications. Um, if you're not familiar with Portland limestone cement, you take some ordinary Portland cement, which is what you would buy at Home Depot, and then you combine it with uh, ground limestone to create PLC. Um, and there's different ways to create it. You can either do it as an addition, in which case it would be a blended cement, or you could do um, an underground PLC, um, which is typically what's done now. All right, so TechStop wanted us to answer some basic questions. Um, mainly, are we going to get the same performance from PLC that we would expect from OPC systems? All right, um, why was TechStop interested in doing something like this? Uh, the main motivation behind this was sustainability benefits. Um, you might be familiar with um, the CO2 emissions and how cement production is a very energy intensive process. For every pound of cement that we produce, we release about um, one pound of CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. So, um, and fit about 50 to 60 percent of that is going to come from the calcination process, um, and depending on how efficient your kiln is. Um, the rest is going to come from the fact that you're going to have to get the temperature really high up um, to trigger the chemical reactions that we're looking for. All right, so um, the nice thing about including limestone in the system is that the limestone does not have to be calcined. Okay, so you save a little bit on the calcination process and you also save in terms of not having to actually burn it up. Um, a lot of people have done uh, a number of studies now on type 1L cements, which are permitted under um, ASTM C595, uh, which allow up to about uh, up to 50% limestone, um, and that results in about 10% um, reduction in CO2 emissions. All right, so this was a very large project that lasted about four years or so, um, and we tested a bunch of stuff, including fresh concrete properties, uh, we did some characterization, um, hardened concrete properties, and durability. And this presentation is going to focus on the mechanical property side of things um, that are highlighted and on the uh, bulk electrical resistivity. All right, so a little bit of background on uh, Portland limestone cement if you go and look at the literature. Um, this is not something new. The Europeans have been doing it for decades. Um, they've been doing it since the 60s because they're a little bit smarter than us. Um, so we're trying to play catch up now um, because ASTM did not allow any limestone until 2005 um, for C-157 and then in 2012, it's when they started allowing up to 50% in the C-595 designation. Um, initially, people believed that the limestone filler was going to be inert. Um, we know that now that's not really true um, some of the limestone is going to react, and even if it doesn't react, it's going to help the hydration process by providing nucleation and growth sites. It's going to increase particle packing. So that's going to increase your strength, and it's going to reduce your porosity. Um, you're also going to form some additional hydrates that you won't typically form otherwise, um, known as carboaluminate hydrates, including uh, hemicarboaluminate and monocarboaluminate. Um, again, uh, a lot of people have done work on this, and they've been able to prove that if you go up to about 15% limestone, you, you can expect a similar compressive strength. Um, so the question that we wanted to answer was 10% sustainability benefit, you know, that's great, but can we go further than that? Can we really push the envelope to try to go after some um, 
some greener non-heat mixes. So we're saying, well, what's going to happen if we kick it up a notch putting, by putting more limestone into cement, and on top of that, combining it with SCMs? Right. So those are the project objectives. We're trying to evaluate those mechanical properties for these lower clinker systems, um, trying to evaluate the effect of SEMs, um, trying to see if maybe we could come up with equivalent compressive strength, even at the um, low clinker dosages, and then also trying to study the, some of the well-established relationships that we have between compressive strength, tensile strength, and modules of elasticity. Um, this presentation can be summarized, or you can see it in a um, journal paper that was published earlier this year. So I've provided the reference for you. Um, the paper was published in the Cement Journal, which is open access. It's completely, completely free to view it and download it. Um, and if you have any questions, shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to get with you one on one. All right, so um, the way that we did this is we got two cement plants in the state of Texas to make some custom cements for us. Um, they were already making uh, type 1L cement, so you can see PLC2 and PLC6 where the type 1L cements, so we asked the cement plants to put more limestone in there. So cement plant 1 was able to produce um, a couple of cements with 21 and 30% limestone, and uh, PLC7 was from the other cement plant with um, about 15% limestone, but I should note that they did a very good job grinding that cement um, and made it very reactive, and that's going to be important here in just a few minutes. We also used um, class F, class C fly ashes, grade 100 slag, and uh, silica fume for this study. Um, totally, we cast about 42 mixes, if I remember correctly. Um, the first two columns show straight cement mixes at two different water cement ratios, 0.4 and 0.45, and then um, we did all of the SEM mixes at a water to cement ratio of 0.45. So that included um, all of the SEMs that I mentioned in the previous slide at different dosage levels. For every single mix, we cast 16 cylinders and we tested um, compressive strength and bulk electrical resistivity at four different ages and then tensile strength and modulus elasticity at two ages. Um, as far as the nomenclature, the first box tells you the type of cement that was used, second box tells you um, if any SEMs were used and how much, and then the last box tells you the wire to cement ratio in the system. Um, something that's important in terms of uh, reactivity for cement is the fineness, and um, as has been well established, as you increase the limestone content, that's going to um, result in a finer cement typically, which is going to make it more reactive. Um, and this is, again, this is well established. People have observed this. Um, this is the reason why you get an increase in compressive strength, because limestone serves as a grinding aid for the clinker, making it more reactive. All right, so let's talk about the actual results um, as far as compressive strength goes. Um, your control mix is the solid blue line, PLC1. So you can see the type 1L cement for that same plant, PLC2. Um, had basically the same strength, um, and then PLC3 and PLC4 decreased um, substantially, and then we observed um, a similar trend for PLC5 through PLC7. But if we take those results and we normalize it by the clinker plus gypsum fraction, you're going to see that yes, there is a cement dilution effect, okay, but if you compare PLC1, which is, I don't know if this is going to work, you can't see that anyway. So if you look at the blue solid curve, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so that would be our control right there. PLC2 is way up here, PLC3 right there, and then PLC4 would be the right one. So it's almost um, at the same level. And that is telling us, okay, that's further evidence that the limestone is not just an inert filler, which we already knew. We're forming additional hydrates. We're getting more strength out of this. We also played around with the um, effective water to cement ratio because, again, we were diluting the, um, the cement. So we're trying to figure out if we normalize it by the amount of limestone that is present in each cement, 
um, all of these mixes have the same effective one to cement ratio because of that increasing limestone content. And you can see they're all uh, approximately equal in terms of compressive strength. So we plotted um, compressive strength as a function of effective water to cement ratio to see if we could get a good trend line for that. And you can see that it's reasonable uh, for water to cement ratios of 0.4, um, and it's not as, um, as clear for the higher cement, uh, water to cement ratio, excuse me. For the, what was more interesting is when we started pushing the envelope and started combining the high limestone contents with SCMs, and as you can see here, um, so all of this is the increasing limestone content for first cement plant, and then for the second cement plant, you see them here. All of these mixes have 20% uh, class F fly ash. And if I give you the control mixture at 28 days, this would be your OPC. And at 91 days, you can see that there's a significant strength drop off. Okay, but if we look at that a little bit closer, and I give you those percentages, which are the combined clinker plus gypsum content, this is telling us that we're using 50% less cement than we typically would in a concrete mix. And you can see even at that replacement level, we're still getting more than 5,000 PSI at 91 days. So even though the cement decreased by 50%, the strength decreased by 38% for this case. Um, for the second cement plant, the results are even better. If I give you the control there at 91 days, for 64% uh, of the cement that we would typically use, we only observed a 10% decrease in the compressive strength. Okay, so this was a little bit better performance than we were expecting. And so we were interested is this, um, in seeing if this was similar for other SCMs. So for Class C fly ash, as you might expect, because it's more reactive, we saw even better results. Okay, so you see all of the percentages there. Notice that mix right there, 40% of the cement that we would typically use. Okay, and we're still getting 6,000 PSI um, strength at 28 days. All right, so I'm just highlighting the mixes with the lowest cement contents, and you can see that they're performing very well. Um, slag performed equally as well. Okay, so very low clinker contents. And then we also did some ternary mixes where we combined glassy fly ash and silica fume. Um, and again, we got better performance than we were expecting. Um, this particular mix was a little bit lower than we were expecting, but again, we're seeing, we're getting reasonable compressive strengths which a much lower um, cement content, right? This was the PLC4, so this had 30% limestone in the cement, and you can see, again, very low cementitious content, and we were getting very reasonable strengths. Um, this is showing the same thing, so I'm just gonna skip over this in the interest of time, okay? But it's a different cement, different SEMs, we're seeing the same thing. All right, so we were also interested in seeing um, the tensile strength to compressive strength ratio. We all know that for regular concrete, we can expect about 10% tensile strength. So we were wondering, is that going to hold uh, true for uh, PLC concrete? Um, and the answer was, for the most part, yes. Um, with an increasing limestone content, so as we're moving in this direction, we actually um, observed an increase in that ratio um, for each cement plant. Okay, so this is again, no SCMs. When you throw SCMs into the picture, you get a little bit more variation, but you're still within that eight to 12% that we would expect. All right, so we're getting the same performance um, out of PLC that we would um, expect out of OPC. Um, the next question was, um, are we going to be able to use the equation that's in the code to predict the modulus of elasticity if we know the compressive strength, is that gonna be accurate? All right, so we plotted the predicted to experimental elastic modulus of 28 days. Um, so in other words, if we got a value of one, that would be a perfect prediction. And if the value was lower than that, 
it would be a conservative prediction from a structural engineering um, point of view when you're designing. So you see that it was right on the money for um, some of the mixes, and then after that, um, it was still reasonably close, around 0.9, um, and it would be a conservative prediction. So we observed that for the straight cement mixes, and we observed the same thing for um, the, the, the mixes with SCMs as well. Right, so that's showing that, and then this is showing again the same thing, uh, PLC7, so this is the second plant, 50% uh, limestone and different dosages of SEMs. Again, it's around 0.9 or so. Um, the reason why I was kind of blazing through that is because the bulk electrical resistivity, I think, shows the most important um, results of this, of this study. Um, so I kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time on that. All right, so if we, if we look at the control mix and we look at the bulk electrical resistivity, which is um, indicative of the permeability of the concrete, we're going to see that as we increase the limestone content, the resistivity is going to decrease. In other words, the concrete is going to be more permeable. So we did that for the first plant, and we did that for the second plant, and we experienced, or we observed the same thing. Excuse me, our control for the second plant would be the orange line that you see there on top, and then it was either the same or lower. Um, we tried to see if there was a relationship between resistivity and effective water to cement ratio, and we didn't observe a clear trend. Um, in general, yes, your resistivity is going to decrease um, as your water to cement ratio increases, but it wasn't as uh, well correlated as I was expecting. Now, this is um, the picture that I like the most um, in this presentation because it's a very powerful one. If you compare type one cement at a 0.45 water to cement ratio, that's the electrical resistivity that you're gonna get. If you increase the limestone content and use an SCM, like class C fly ash at 30% replacement, you're going to notice that you're going to get about the same resistivity independent of your limestone content. So, this shows the overpowering effect of SCMs on bulk electrical resistivity, and that is going to allow you to go after um, very, very durable concrete because um, people have done studies on this and they've correlated a resistivity value of 10 kilo ohms times centimeter um, of 10 or higher with low chloride penetration. So, that's not something that you're going to be able to achieve with a type 1 mix um, at a water to cement ratio of 0.45, excuse me. Uh, but you can do it even when you're using 50% less cement than you typically would if you have an SCM that's there to help you. If we plot the same results for the second plant now, okay, the control mix would be here at a water to cement ratio of 0.45. And we said, well, what if we do it at 0.4? How big of an effect is that going to be? And you can see that in the orange line just above it. Yes, it increased the resistivity, but it wasn't very significant. But once again, once we started throwing SEMs into the mix, especially slag, which is um, a very effective SEM in terms of uh, refining the porosity and, and decreasing the permeability, again, we would expect low chloride penetration for these mixes, indicating um, more durable concrete. Um, so that summarizes the results of the mechanical properties. Um, we did additional testing, um, and that's been published, so if you're interested in checking that out as well, I've included that. Uh, my collaborator, uh, Nick Tavorsi, he's published two papers out of the same project that proves um, we get pretty good performance out of these systems if we're using SEMs, even at high limestone contents. All right, so the conclusions that I wanted to mention there, if we have a constant water to cement ratio, you can expect similar compressive strength, up to 15% limestone um, in PLC. Um, if you are not using SEMs after that, then you can expect to see a significant uh, drop off in strength. 
The effective water to cement ratio is a better predictor of compressive strength because you have to um, normalize by the cement content. Um, the, same trans the same trends are going to hold for PLC concrete in terms of uh, modulus of elasticity and tensile strength. Um, the electrical resistivity is going to decrease as the limestone content increases, which is going to make the concrete more permeable. But the big one would be we can still get good quality, strong, durable concrete if we have SEMs, even if we're using very high limestone content of 30%, which is currently not permitted. So that would summarize, that would end my presentation. I just want to acknowledge um, the folks at TechSot who funded the project, um, Dr. Maria Younger and Dr. Mike Thomas, who provided valuable insight, and then undergrad students and um, lab staff that helped uh, complete this project.